Hi guys. We are live. So welcome to a great live at five. I'm Anna Rebeck, social media strategist for the LSU Ag Center. And it is National Pollinator Week, and we are celebrating it here at the Ag Center. And we have special guests, LSU Ag Center Associate Professor Kristen Healy and postdoctoral researcher Thomas O'Shea Weller. And they're going to talk about native pollinators, honeybees, and of course, what you can do to help pollinators. So um, thank you all for being here. And can you all give us a little bit of background about yourselves before we start? Sure. Um, I'll start. Um, my name is Kristen Healy, and as Anna said, I'm an associate professor at LSU. Um, actually, a lot of my background is public health entomology, um, but when I started here at LSU in 2013, we kind of realized the importance of um, understanding some um, factors that influence honeybee health and um, later on in some of our research, pollinator health as well. So. Um, at the time, we didn't really have too much of a uh, pollinator person in the entomology department at LSU, so it provided a lot of excellent opportunities. So, um, so that's me. Cool. Great. Um, my name is Thomas Oshawala, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher also at LSU. And Kristen kind of laid out nicely that they're interested in the department in branching out more into the pollinator health area. So I was hired really to look into that specifically with honeybees. Um, I've been managing a large scale um, project that's been funded by the Institute of Farming and Agriculture, looking at the main factors influencing the health of um, honeybees. So that's really where my research focuses. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here again. And guys, remember, if y'all have pollinator questions, please ask them along the way. And um, I'll, I'll give it over to Kristen and you know, y'all can go to it about pollinators. I'm excited. Great, thank you, Anna. So it's exciting to be here. Um, I figured we'd first start off by um, talking about what a pollinator is. I'm sure most of you know kind of what a pollinator is, but for those of you that uh, don't know, um, because most people think about bees, but it's more than just bees that are pollinators. And um, really a pollinator is any type of animal that transfers pollen from one plant to the next. Um, and when we think about pollinators, we think about flowering plants, you know, including a lot of flowering plants that will uh, eventually produce maybe a fruit or a vegetable. Um, and so with pollination, it's really a plant's way of trying to get that pollen from a male part of the plant to a female part of the plant. And so plants actually have a lot of different strategies that um, have allowed that pollen to get from male to female part. Um, and so some strategies could be wind pollination um, and some plants are cross pollinating. Um, some plants just can pollinate themselves without any other um, enhanced mechanism. But actually a vast majority of the flowering plants uh, require some kind of animal for pollination. So this is actually most plants, uh, flowering plants will require a pollinator. And so when we think about um, this, in order for this to work, um, you kind of need different characteristics um, in an animal that does that. So again, a pollinator is really any kind of animal. Um, when we think about pollinators, um, you know, what's a good pollinator? There's a lot of different characteristics um, that um, allow a pollinator to be a pollinator. And so, you know, we can, um, it's not just bees. And I know like bees are great. We all think about bees, um, but actually wasps and butterflies and moths and beetles and flies, there's plenty of animals out there that can also function as pollinators. And I think that's a, a really important thing that I want the public to understand is that uh, just because something's a visitor in your garden, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad visitor. Um, you know, and taking, for example, wasps, you know, when most people think about wasps, I know at least with my kids, this strikes a huge amount of fear um, to my kids, um, the idea of a wasp. But a wasp is actually quite a beneficial insect. Um, you know, they'll visit flowers, so they'll actually function as pollinators. And on top of that, they'll actually um, are predators on some bad organisms in the uh, in your garden. So. You know, I think it's it's really important to kind of emphasize that 
you know, there's not every insect in your garden is bad. And a lot of them are very useful. And a lot of them can function as pollinators. And, you know, I just also want the public to realize that we at the Ag Center are a huge resource for the public. Um, so, you know, if you have a garden pest, something you just, you're not sure if it's a pollinator, you're not sure if it's good or if it's bad, you know, you can always come to the Ag Center to us um, and we can help you identify that um, and we can, you know, help determine if it's good or bad. So um, back to how would they, um, how would everyone go about um, sending in, you know, photos or how to ID a pest from the Ag Center, like from y'all? Yeah, that's great. Uh, great question. So we have really two ways we can help uh, the public identifying uh, insects. Uh, one is by submitting uh, the actual insect to us. Um, and we do um, take live specimens. Uh, we have kind of instructions on our entomology website on like how, who to contact and how to get us the specimens. Uh, you can really contact um, most of us at, in the entomology department. It's a small department and we all communicate with each other. Um, so, you know, you're always welcome to just call or email one of us and we can help. Um, we do get a ton of pictures sent to us. We have a contact us page on our entomology website and it has a little upload function. Um, so people can upload photos um, and submit them to us. Um, we do usually ask that uh, if people are gonna upload photos, they use something as a reference for size. So if you have a ruler handy or a coin or something that we can use to kind of help gauge the, the size of the insect. Um, but we do that a lot. You know, we have some of our taxonomists in the department are so trained, well-trained in insect identification. Um, they can identify really blurry photos that you wouldn't even know if there was an insect in it. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, anyways, <laughs> so that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I, and back to what makes a good pollinator, you know, there's a, a lot of things that make a good pollinator. Um, you know, and, and there's a reason why most of us do think about bees as pollinators for that reason. Um, you know, one is the ability to carry pollen. You know, so if you're uh, an insect and you're traveling from plant to plant, uh, you need a mechanism that's going to allow that pollen to stick to you and go on to the next flower. And so with the case of bees, bees are actually very hairy. Um, and so when a bee visits a flower, you know, all those hairs, pollen grains stick to those hairs. Um, so again, that's kind of one of the reasons why we do think about um, bees, just like, yeah, the bumblebee, all of that fuzzy hair when they travel to a plant, um, all those pollen is going to stick to them. Um, also, you know, a lot of bees have specialized structures. So in the case of the honeybee, um, honeybees have these specialized structures on their legs called pollen baskets. Uh, as you can see in the picture, you probably can uh, locate some bees there that have, look like they have these thick legs because these pollen baskets are just designed for um, collecting large amounts of pollen. Now they use those because they're bringing the pollen back to their nests, but as they go from flower to flower, um, they're also, you know, pollinating flowers as well. And so really it's kind of the, this idea of, of being able to pick up uh, pollen, those hairs, that this makes them really great pollinators. Um, another thing that makes a great pollinator is its behavior. Um, so do they visit certain flowers? Are they generalists? So are they more inclined to kind of go and, and feast on a variety of flowers or are they going to be specific? Um, again, when we think about honeybees, uh, the cool thing about honeybees is they communicate a really good nectar source. So when they find a good, you know, they'll go miles in search of food. And when they locate a food source that's really good, um, they'll come back to the hive and they'll communicate that location to the other hive mates. Um, and so usually you'll see kind of here, you see a picture of bees. You'll have um, them performing this waggle dance. And this dance will actually tell uh, the other bees the distance and the location of that food source. And so this is great for um, flowers um, because you know that you know that they're going to be um, frequenting those um, those particular species of flowers. Um, so that benefits the, the flower um, as well. Um, and then the other thing is having some types of bees that are specialist. 
Um, so the other side of that. So honeybees are very generalist. Um, they'll try to find the, the best nutritious food sources. Um, but on the flip side, you do have some insects that are uh, specialist. So we'll talk later about squash bees that um, prefer to feed on squash flowers or blueberry bees or alfalfa leaf cutter bees. Um, these are more specialized. So it's going to benefit um, the bee to have these types of plants in their environment, and it's going to benefit those types of plants to have that uh, species of bee. Um, and then lastly, where, where it comes to making a good pollinator is um, some of the other uh, factors in kind of their biology, um, their anatomy. Um, so when we think about, um, you know, bees are very diverse and they have a very diverse um, kind of size and shape. Um, the tongue length is actually really, really important. So, um, you know, with bees, they'll have short tongues or long tongues. Um, when you look at a butterfly or a moth, their, their mouth parts are actually coiled. And so it's incredibly long, like this long straw that'll uncoil. And by having those super long tongues, that will allow them to access um, nectar from flowers that other other organisms can't get to. Um, so there's different advantages, you know, so maybe a small size bee might have an advantage in kind of getting to like hidden areas within a flower, uh, whereas butterflies and moths might have kind of different advantages to um, getting inside long tube-like uh, flowers. And so really when you think about um, all of these different factors, you think about, you know, the hairiness of bees, you think of their behavior, the social behaviors of uh, honeybees and bumblebees, um, and you think about kind of a um, uh, lot of those diversity and tongue lengths and um, its biology, um, you really start to see why there is so much more of an emphasis on bees during pollinator week and um, why we really focus a lot on honeybees. Um, I should say in terms of bees, you know, there's uh, over 4,000 species of bees that function as pollinators in the U.S. So it's certainly way more than just the honeybee when we think about pollinators. Um, in Louisiana alone, we have over 200 species of bees that um, serve as important pollinators. Um, so again, that's, um, you know, and just something to think about. It's, it's not just the honeybees, but, you know, if we're gonna talk about pollinators, um, which is pollinator week, that's why we're here. You kind of do have to start with the big elephant in the room and, and that's the honeybee, you know, the one that's been domesticated for as long as we've, you know, we've been farming in the, around the globe um, and one that is heavily used in pollinator services today. So um, I'm gonna pass it over to Thomas, who's gonna um, talk to us about uh, the honeybees. And then later we'll talk about other pollinators. Thank you, Kristen. Um... Thomas, just to let you know, we do have all of your, your photos and your data as well. So if you need something pulled up, just let me know. Okay, so I'll just show. Sure. Um, one thing, since I should probably try and make it as accessible as possible, if any questions come up which kind of show that it needs to be shed some more light on a certain section, then I'm fine to answer those as we go along because that way we can make sure that everyone's following all the time. Sounds <laughs> okay. good. All right, so... As Kristen said, honeybees are very important. Um, in fact, the pollination industry itself, at least in the United States, relies very heavily on, on honeybees. There are also pollination services involving um, bumblebees commercially as well, and I believe some other species, including solitary bees. But honeybees form uh, by far the largest part of the industry. And just to give you some figures, an idea of how profitable and how important this is, um, the almond industry alone in California generates over 80% of the world's almonds. So it's a pretty astounding figure really considering it's just one state. And that entire process, as you can see from this picture here, you've got these uh, trees, almond trees that are growing in the uh, Central Valley areas of California. And it's not a natural habitat for almond trees to grow. Indeed, it's not a natural habitat really for any kind of uh, crop plant that needs pollination to grow. So there are no natural pollinators that can service this system. So what happens is people have to bring in pollinators to provide a service and honeybees fill this role excellently because they can be moved around the country 
um, on uh, trucks and moved as crops come into uh, bloom at different times of the year. And this process is known within the industry. I think the uh, term that they, they coined is chasing the bloom, which is, I think, quite a nice kind of analogy because you see these different crops blooming at different times. And so they can provide the, uh, the hives that are needed to um, allow the crops to be pollinated. Now, despite how profitable this system is and how effective honeybees generally are at actually overall being able to pollinate crops and provide the service, there's significant problems within the industry. And the main one, which I think most people by this point are familiar with, is the levels of colony loss. So the rate at which bees die on a yearly basis, honeybees specifically. And some figures that I got for, for last year, for example, overwinter losses for honeybees are coming in at a roughly 37.5% for the commercial sector. And generally these are colonies that are being um, managed very well. And that figure gets even worse when we start to include uh, hobbyist and sideline beekeepers. It jumps to over 40%. So that's a very high rate of loss and it occurs on a yearly basis. And these bees have to be replaced. So if you're a beekeeper and you're losing that percentage of your colonies every year, and then you have to find new bees, replace them, and new queens. And on top of that, you're basing the amount of money you can generate as a business on over the end of the winter, the size of colonies you're providing to farmers, because farmers value a larger colony of bees, more bees can do more pollination. It's it's a big concern, and the industry itself needs to remain sustainable over the long term. So a lot of the science really here is geared towards trying to work out what the main factors are that are killing bees and causing these high levels of loss in commercial systems and trying to kind of reduce and bring those losses down to more uh, manageable levels for both economic and of course just general sustainability reasons. So that's kind of really where the research that I'm working on at the moment comes in. The uh, study that I'm working on at the moment is a, is a very large scale um, field study where we're looking over a two-year period, we, we have all the data now for it, but taking measurements over a two-year period, following um, hundreds of colonies, in fact, over 700 of them over two years, uh, that are being moved around the country to provide pollination services and seeing what factors are really leading to uh, colony losses for bees to die and what factors aren't so important. So we're taking all kinds of measurements um, over the time period and we're seeing what things correlate with, with colonies that die and what things correlate with colonies that are doing well. Um, so I guess to, to unpack that a little bit, there are a number of things that we consider to be potentially important and that's really how we inform what things we're sampling for. And those fall into several categories. So we have um, parasites, that's a, that's a big one. You have uh, varroa mites, which are quite dangerous, and we'll go into those in just a minute, um, and, and some other parasites that affect bees. You have uh, pathogens, so there's a, a whole plethora of viruses and fungal pathogens and bacteria that can affect uh, colonies as they're moved around. Now, the thing that needs to be bared in, born, uh, born in mind here is that because this system involves colonies being moved around on trucks in very close proximity, disease can spread a lot easier, um, as it can in other agricultural systems where you have animals involved. And so pathogens and parasites are definitely a very big one we're concerned about. We also sample, of course, for agrochemical residues because pesticides, herbicides, uh, fungicides, and some of the various other chemicals that are used in agricultural systems are an ongoing concern for uh, honeybees um, as they are for other animals. So that's something that we can sample in the pollen and the nectar to see how much of these chemicals the bees are being exposed to and to these levels correlate with um, changes in survival or the health of colonies. We also have things such as the forage available. So the crop types that these bees are foraging in are quite important because if you think about a crop, it's effectively a monoculture and bees have evolved to have a diverse um, diet of different types of nectar and pollen available to them. So then when they're foraging with a crop, for example, almonds, there's nothing but almond trees for miles and miles in, in every direction. So it then becomes a concern of those bees getting the dietary, uh, the dietary needs fulfilled. Um, if not, is that having a serious impact on their health? Finally, you have some other larger scale things that we can't control too much as, as humans, but are nevertheless important to consider in the study. So we look at things like the, the weather, um, the level of drought or rainfall in an area and 
some of the uh, natural habitat types that are around in the area um, and seeing how that influences or indeed uh, does not influence the uh, health of colonies. So that kind of sums up the sort of research we're doing. We're taking all these factors, we're seeing how they affect the health of colonies. And I think what's important about, not unique, but definitely important about some of the research we're doing here is we're, we're tracking the health of colonies over time. So it's, it's what we call a longitudinal study. And what that does is it lets you see as a colony goes through its life cycle through the, um, the industry of, of pollinating different crops, how does the size of the colony change and the health change over time as it's exposed to all these potential different stresses? And I think that's very important because if you were, for example, conducting a study um, in, in public health, so in humans, you, you might wanna look at how different factors uh, affect the health of people over time. And so it's very important to have this kind of continued um, update on the outcome of an individual so you can trace negative effects to where their actual causes are uh, in the population. Right, so I guess that kind of sums it up really um, for what we're looking at. And I think it's probably useful for me to share some of the preliminary results and things we found that may be of interest to people with general yeah. interest in maybe health. Okay, um, right, so I guess to start off, one thing that immediately jumped out to us as being very important were the levels of um, this parasitic mite that I mentioned at the beginning, Ferroa destructor. So great name. And pretty scary looking animal, as you can see there from the uh, the image. And the name is not misleading because these mites really will destroy colonies of honeybees left unchecked. In fact, they're a uh, invasive species um, for the European honeybee in that they evolved originally with the very closely related uh, Asian honeybee, which is Apis serrana. And they were able to somewhat coexist with colonies of those bees. However, when they, jumped species to the European honeybee, which is Apis prolifera, the bees are mostly unable to uh, detect the mites. So you can see from that image there, it sounds like a ridiculous notion that they would not be able to detect the mites, because you can see the mite is pretty much a bumblebee about this size, really large, and they, they feed on the fat of the bees, which is really analogous to, to their liver. So if you can imagine this sort of thing that's the size of American football feeding on your liver the whole time, you think you might notice it, but actually bees are very uh, cue dependent in how they notice things. And so they really do have trouble controlling these um, within the colonies. And they're incredibly devastating. They'll, they'll correlate very strongly with the death of colonies. And I think anyone who is seriously into beekeeping or professional beekeepers and indeed scientists are generally uh, quite aware of this already, that for our mites, if not kept under control, will uh, definitively usually destroy uh, colonies. Now, that's really the main factor we found that we could use to predict whether a colony would die or not. So we look at the levels of these mites in terms of the, the rate of infestation um, and uh, level of mortality and survival. And I, I believe, uh, Anna, you have a, a graph that I gave you that could show the relationship between these. There we go, perfect. So it's a very... <laughs> very stripped down simple graph, but basically you see on the bottom, you have uh, the level of varroa. So as, the, as that goes up, that means the level of mite is increasing the level of infestation um, within the colony. And then next to that on the, on the Y axis, you have percentage mortality. And you can see that the trend really kind of shows that as the level of uh, mites in a colony move up, the percentage rate of colony death increases and once you get to those higher mite levels you see all those points along the top you start to get pretty much 100 percent risk of mortality which is pretty uh pretty extreme uh especially in a in a system where there's all these other stresses that that can impact things so mites are, are very important and not only do the mites themselves cause harm but there's a sort of double um negative to them in that they transmit a lot of the diseases and pathogens, a lot, several diseases and pathogens that are also very damaging to, to bees. And so there are three, uh, or well, there are more than three, but there's um, several viruses that are particularly um, of concern, which these mites transmit. So you have deformed wing virus, you also have chronic bee um, paralysis virus, and there are several others, but a lot of the work we've been doing has been focusing on deformed wing virus because a lot of data seems to suggest that it's one of the more uh, harmful pathogens. And 
what happens is that these mites are causing damage by feeding on the bees, by uh, removing fat from them and wounding them, and also they're transmitting viruses. And when the uh, mites transmit these viruses, it seems to amplify the level of infection of the virus within the colony. So imagine that you, uh, you have a, some kind of disease, but then you're being fed on by a parasite, and that amplifies the um, amount of infection within your body. And that seems to be happening uh, with the bees. So the viruses are made worse by their transmission by the mite, and the mites themselves are doing damage. So there's this sort of complex occurring, we call it maybe a, a varroa virus complex that, that really does a lot of damage to colonies, and, and it can spread fast because the mites are can, can move from colony to colony and they can wait on flowers and kind of hop onto bees. And uh, some of the practices within the industry of um, mixing together uh, groups of bees from different colonies. And also on top of that, you have bees, when there's a group of uh, hives in an area and they're close together and bees are leaving to forage and come back, sometimes they make a mistake and they'll go into the wrong hive. And again, that's another way through which um, Varroa and its viruses uh, can spread. So really, this is a system is putting a lot of pressure on bees. And on top of that, you have them uh, moving around sometimes to areas where there isn't a lot of food. So they need to be supplementary, uh, supplementally fed. Um, and so in a system that already could be quite stressful, having this invasive mite really makes things uh, a lot worse and helps to explain these very high levels of mortality that we observe. Now, Moving on from where do we go from there? So we know the mite's very bad. We know that it's transmitting viruses and it's, it's, it's destroying bee colonies. Um, how do we start to, to come to some solutions to that? And one of the things that we were looking at within our study is, is a potential answer to that. Because along with looking at some of the general stresses that uh, affect bee colonies, we were also trying out or trialing two different stocks of bees. Now, half of the colonies in our study belonged to uh, standard commercial stock. So um, as you can see from this picture here, um, I'm not actually sure what stock of bees uh, are being sampled here. Probably some of both because we mixed the stocks up in the different apiaries. This is in um, uh, the Dakotas, this particular image. So we had half of the um, bees belonging to the standard commercial stock or breed of bee that's being used at the moment. For anyone who's unsure about what's meant by a stock of bees, uh, it's, a, it's effectively an artificially bred um, variety of bees. So they've been bred for certain characteristics, for example, uh, large colony size or plenty of honey production. The second stock that we used was a stock known as pole line bees. And they're, or at least were at the time, uh, a sort of experimentally developed stock, which were developed um, here in Louisiana at the uh, USDA honeybee research lab with whom this work was conducted. Um, and there, these pole line bees have been developed to be uh, resistant to, to varroa mites, to, to these invasive mites. And the way they're able to do that is they can detect the mites when they're infesting a brood cell. And that's the way the mites reproduce is they'll crawl into a brood cell of the bee while it's developing. And then when the cells capped over, they'll start feeding on the developing larvae and uh, they'll reproduce within the cell. So, so the mother will, uh, the mother mite will produce uh, offspring and the offspring have soft bodies as does the male so for them to reproduce the whole cycle has to occur within the uh, secluded uh, environment of the cell now in pole line bees because the workers can detect when a cell is infested they'll simply open the cell up and drag the uh, infested brood out and throw it away which stops the mites from effectively reproducing and if the mites can't re reproduce very quickly, then the population can't explode within the colony, the population of mites. And so that infestation never really reaches the same level or never peaks. And that means less virus and just generally less issue for the bees because mite levels are kept low and manageable. And we tested those out against, uh, in comparison to, a, to the standard commercial stock. And the results we found were quite striking because uh, within the first year of the study, we found that there was double the level of survival in these uh, developed mite resistance stock compared to the commercial variety. And I should also note that we found that the levels of honey production and general population size were comparable. So the pole line bees were able to keep most of the beekeeping characteristics that make standard bees attractive, but they also had built in resistance to, to the mites, which produced a lot higher level of survival. Um, 
one of the really interesting things was that because this uh, increased survival and, and mite defense is being done by the bees, it doesn't take any extra work from, from a beekeeper or from anyone doing management. You don't have to apply a treatment to get the benefit of um, the bees removing um, the mites and keeping the mite levels down or put in any extra labor. So it's, it's really a kind of ideal situation because the bees are doing all of the work themselves. And of course, it's also, um, I mean, we talk about integrated uh, pest control and pest solution. This is really one of the most integrated forms of pest control because the, uh, the species you're rearing is doing, is doing it itself. So that's one of the um, key findings really from the study. The, the other thing I think I should stress at this point is, so we said that varroa mites are very important and so it appears the viruses that they transmit, but they are not the only thing that affects the health of uh, bees. Because, I mean, it, it's, it's an obvious statement, but to, to clarify on that a little bit more, the level of food that bees were getting throughout the year was incredibly important because in some cases, they'll go quite a while with colonies being placed in an area where there's no natural forage or, or food source. So generally beekeepers will supplement the, um, the hides with either a kind of sugar solution or um, also soya-based protein um, pollen substitute. So that gives them a protein and a carbohydrate source. Now, of course, it isn't ideal because they're not necessarily as good as a, as a natural crop-based source, but it still helps to tide them over and avoid starvation. And in some cases where there wasn't sufficient feeding, we, we experienced starvation events. Finally, on top of that, uh, rainfall and drought turned out to be actually quite important because when there's too much drought in an area, um, it really damages the floral resources available to bees and curtails honey production because of course that needs water. And like it would with any other kind of animal, it, it can be very damaging. Um, but overall, I think, in almost every case, we need to be aware that you can't necessarily always put a fix or catch on what it is that's killing the bees because it varies from situation to situation and um, crop type and also the operation that's being run. That there are different problems in different situations. That's fair enough. Um, is, it, is this you in this photo? That is not uh, me. This is actually my colleague, Dave, who I should... Uh, I have several dramatic shots of Dave in various... Uh, <laughs> situations but uh, Dave who works at the USDA honeybee lab um, here in Baton Rouge he uh, this was taken in the central valley areas of California so that crop behind him I'm not sure what that is but there's almond trees uh, over to the right and I'm standing amongst the almond trees I took the picture I just thought he looked very majestic in that particular so I uh, I decided to take a snapshot <laughs> that's pretty cool it's like you have some good photos in here so I wanted to oh yeah so I, I can maybe Give a little background so this particular image is really interesting to me because it's uh, one of the holding yards we have for colonies in california and i think you can see stretching off into the background miles and miles of these of these colonies to give you an idea of the scale of these operations and they they put them in these holding yards uh, over the winter before almond pollination which happens in february and of course there's no real food available for the bees to forage so that's why the uh, supplemental feeding appears to be quite important um, they're held there and then um, as we move into uh, February kind of time of year and the almonds start to come into bloom, they, they move them from these holding areas into um, the almond orchards. That's super cool. I'm like, I just wanted to put that in there. And there's a video. Can I play the video? It's, um, it's a, I think it's a hive. It just, you sent me. Uh, you can indeed play the video. I'm not sure which of the videos it is. I think it's probably the first one, but Let's give it a go it. and we'll see. Um, this one, it's a little oh, yeah. sad, but right. So that particular video is actually during honey, honey extraction. So that's occurring up in the Dakotas and, uh, they're colonies from the study, um, that we were, we were working on and around, I believe it's late August, September time. Um, they pull the honey from the, um, from the colonies to, because of course honey is another source of revenue for beekeepers, it's not just pollination services. And as you can see, the scale of the operation and the number of bees in the air, often it, the air is sort of thick with bees and it, it, it really just gives you an idea of how densely packed all of these colonies are and how intense the operation really is, which I think from the, 
what we were talking about earlier, it helps you to understand how disease can be such a big issue because it can really spread quickly in these kind of um, environments. Extremely, like that's crazy. Um, could you do me a favor and call Kristen because I think her signal dropped. Okay. And, um, yeah, I would like to get her back on if we can. But okay. um, in the meantime, oh, she's back. Oh, she's back, okay, great. She is. <laughs> Good timing, y'all. Hey, I must have hit something. I don't know. Uh, I apologize for that. But. You're back. But uh, no, I just want to hear the whole time. So, yeah. awesome. Thanks, uh, Thomas. Were you done? Because I was like, I don't want to interrupt. Um, I think that pretty much covered most of the main points. Um, I didn't know how many uh, additional questions there might be during during that, so I, I I tried to keep it light. But there is an extra bit that I should probably cover quickly, which um, just to sure. kind of round off from what I've been talking about. Um, in terms of a practical step that we're really getting from our research and things that people perhaps if they if they keep bees um, and they're not already aware of it as a thing, and I think a lot of people are already aware of this, but um, if you can do one thing really in the management of your colonies to avoid um, sudden collapses and, and, and them dying would really be to, to look for and try and control varroa mites because um, we were seeing that they're, they're really very, very important. And generally speaking, there's a few simple steps and practical procedures you can do to test your colony to see whether the mites are present and in what level, because sometimes they might be present, but not necessarily at a very alarming level. But in other times, it's like, oh, the colony is completely infested and you want to potentially treat for them. Uh, so that's, I think, something, again, maybe we could cover this a bit later when we talk about if people have questions about practical steps. But looking for and controlling these mites is important. Kristen looks like she might. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, I don't know if, if you were going to show a link to this, Anna, but you know, we do have two Ag Center publications um, on the web, and both are different methods for testing for varroa mites. I just put um, them in the comments. Yeah. So, sure. yeah, we have one um, how to test for um, honeybees, how to test honeybees for varroa mites uh, using a sugar roll method. Uh, the great thing about the sugar roll method is that um, it doesn't kill the bees. Um, so, you know, the beekeepers can just go in, um, take a scoop of bees, put them in a mason jar, um, just kind of coat them with powdered sugar, um, shake it out into a, a white pan, and then they can count the varroa mites. Uh, we do also have a different method. It's a little bit more accurate, um, but of course it, it does... Um, it will kill the bees because you're using an alcohol wash. And, you know, we do destructive means, I guess, um, in our own research so we can have an absolute quantity of varroa mites in the hive. But for beekeepers, you can, um, yeah, certainly use the, the powdered sugar method um, as a non-destructive means of the hive. Um, it only really uses a, a handful of bees um, within the hives. Um, also, yeah, I wanted to mention one other thing. The, the research that Thomas talked about, um, he mentioned the USDA. It was a collaborative effort between uh, LSU, uh, the USDA Honeybee Research Lab, where a lot of their initiative is um, breeding and genetics. Um, so that's kind of a, a reason why that that was a major component of that research. Uh, we also work with uh, the largest beekeeper in the country, 80 honey farms in um, they were gracious enough to let us use um, their hives. Um, and the good thing about that is it really gave us that look in um, the commercial beekeeping industry and, and really, you know, making sure that we were using hives, that it was just part of their natural process. So that is so cool. Okay. I'm going to put um, uh, a publication on beginning with bees as well into the comments, guys, from the Ag Center. So y'all can look into beekeeping if you're interested in it. But, um, there we go. And I say destructive, but I don't mean it's destructive <laughs> on the colonies. I shouldn't comment on that. It's it'll just you'll have to sacrifice two hundred bees. Um, but in the grand scheme of thing, you usually have about forty thousand bees within a hive, so it's um, it won't kill the hives to test for mites, um, but you will have to kill two hundred bees. Well, yeah, I think to to addendum what, what Kristen said that. It won't kill the hives to test for mites, but mites will kill the hives if you don't check and test for them. Fair. Okay. Can I, sh your other video where you're scooping bees, what is that for? 
that is exactly what Kristen is is talking about. So yeah, so um, we had another postdoc at the time, Hannah Penn, that uh, put together the video on. Um, it's the same thing. It's just another educational um, tool. Like it's just uh, very descriptive. It'll show step by step how to scoop for bees. Um, again, you kind of want that approximate number of bees because you want to be able to say like for us like we have a certain threshold level um so right now like um in thomas you can interject too but i think most of the publications at least depending on the time of year will say you don't want more than two mites per 100 bees oh wow so, you know part of the uh video i think um kind of will help give you a better visual on what that scoop looks like um so you can quantify <laughs> really the number estimate the number of bees so, so that that particular video that's showing now is me scooping some bees out in a standard measuring size scoop i think i dropped the camera after that but uh, <laughs> as you can see uh so we're when we're sampling colonies throughout the year in, in the study that's one of the key measures we're taking is that's how we're measuring the level of mites over time so we can see um mite populations tend to follow a fairly set pattern of they, they expand as the bee colony population expands um, in the spring and through the summer and they peak in the autumn. Um, and so we're, we're taking measurements uh, like that throughout the year um, and we're seeing how the mite levels uh, increase over time. And one interesting thing about that, I think that a lot of people who haven't done it before might question is that you, you, you can use, um, do it without gloves. I'm just sticking my bare hand in there, which looks yeah. kind of fright frightening, but the bees are actually quite docile, even though I'm putting them in a bucket and knocking them around. Um, it's very context dependent how aggressive bees are going to be. And in this kind of situation, it's it's absolutely fine. I, I don't know whether I'd recommend if you're sampling your own hives as, as an introductory measure to do it that way, but um, you can take bees from the frames and and measure them out into a, into a certain number of bees and then see the mite level for that. And, calculate a mites per 100 bee value and that's really what you need to know in terms of working out whether you need to do anything about treating or not. Okay, thanks for providing that video. That's pretty fascinating. I'm like, I wouldn't want to do it personally, but I believe you. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, uh, did you have any more Thomas on honeybees? Uh, I think for the most part, that covered most of the um, information or results from, um, from the, the research potentially that we'd be interested in. Again, it would kind of be dependent on whether people had any specific questions about that, which I'd be I'd be happy to go in. Um, but that kind of, I think, covers the main sort of thrust of, of where we are. So, so I guess to sum it up, there's a lot of different factors that affect the health of bees. Um, Varroa is a very important one that seems to be pretty consistent. Other things very much depend on the situation and the particular system we're talking about and, and where in the country and what crops the bees are in. Um, but definitely there are some developments on the horizon with dealing with the issue of Varroa by rolling out and that, making available some of these mite resistant um, stocks of bees available to beekeepers um, to really help to try and solve the problem in an integrated fashion. That's super cool. Now, I have a photo of, looks like your team Oh yeah, that is. That's the that's the l large larger part of the uh, sampling team that we were uh, using um, to take all collect all this data throughout the country. So up in the Midwest, the bees are being moved up to the Midwest in the summer, and then they're they're going for the winter in either California or some of them also down in the south in in Mississippi, um, and then going into almond pollination in the spring. So it's a lot of people, a lot of work and uh, over two years and it, we're definitely getting some good results from it though and it's with studies like that that you really need to to prove concepts like whether a certain stock of bees is going to be more effective and also really to define uh, the largest possible scale what factors um, are important so it's, it's not wasted effort so that much that's awesome thank thank you um and also guys we're going to put out a video about the research being done um so i'm excited to present that to y'all very shortly, but not today, but we wanted to give you an insight into what that would look like. Cool. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll start talking a little bit about the other pollinators. So, uh, you know, I think obviously bees are important. Honeybees are important and um, this is pollinator week. So we should probably just at least uh, provide some recognition for some of the other important pollinators as well. 
you know, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just bees, you know, it's wasps and butterflies and moths, um, beetles and flies, you know, all that can function um, as pollinators as well. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's important because, you know, there's a lot of, just as there's a lot of diversity in flowers, there's a lot of diversity in animals and insects that serve as pollinators, you know, when we think about bees, um, bees actually have very limited vision. And so how they see flowers is actually very different from how we see flowers. So they don't actually see the color red. They can only really see things in the color spectrums of the yellows and greens and blues and purples. Um, and so when they look at that flower, you know, it's, it's going to look very different to them. It's not going to look like you see it now. Um, and it's part of that reason why they're probably not going to be a, very attracted to red flowers as well. Um, so that's an important thing if you're thinking about pollinator gardening, which we'll get to later. But, you know, the, the other thing is that we have butterflies and moths, um, and those can serve as pollinators as well. You know, butterflies are great because they actually have a greater diversity of color vision than bees do. Um, and so, you know, they might be more uh, likely to visit uh, more colorful flowers, the reds and things that um, you really won't see the bees going to unless it's like a really good food source that they happen upon um, in nature. And so, you know, that that's kind of an important thing to think about. And, you know, in, in terms of gardening and track, what kind of pollinators that you want to attract, um, you know, and, and thinking about when the time of day that things bloom as well. Um, so I want to mention just really brief, I want to uh, shout out to different pollinators. Um, I hadn't really planned on talking about monarchs, but I feel like that's at least an important thing that we should at least um, mention during pollinator week um, is the monarch butterfly. And, and the monarch, monarch is just this really cool um, butterfly. It's one that actually migrates. So we don't normally think about insects doing these mass migrations, but uh, the monarch butterfly um, through several generations will actually travel from north down to Mexico and, and overwinter there. Um, and along the way, it will require its um, immatures, its caterpillars, to feed on uh, milkweed. Uh, so it's very, very host specific in the plant that it prefers to feed on. So you can see here, it's a very beautiful caterpillar um, looking for milkweed plants. And so you know, there's a, a lot there in terms of um, the importance of loss of, of habitat for monarchs. And uh, you could probably have a whole segment um, on monarch butterflies and selecting um, the appropriate milkweeds um, for monarch butterflies. But I just wanted to make sure that we recognize that as a potential pollinator. Um, another one I wanted to mention are bumblebees. Um, bumblebees are incredibly diverse. Um, they're, again, they're large and hairy, and when we talked about as far as pollinators go, having a lot of um, hair on the body is really help. Uh, with bumblebees, they're cool in that they do this thing called buzz pollination, so they'll actually kind of like go up and buzz, and in that process, it shakes the pollen off of the flowers, and so that makes it a really great pollinator. Uh, it's a generalist. It feeds on a variety of flowers, um, and they're a diverse amount of species of bumblebees as well. So you'll get species that can survive in really cold environments, um, in high elevations, and then you get species that can survive in the flat, humid Louisiana uh, south. I also wanted to mention um, the carpenter bees as well. Um, you know, most people, uh, some people confuse carpenter bees and bumblebees. They are two different, completely two, two different species. Um, carpenter bees look very similar, but they are solitary. So where bumblebees are social insects forming colonies, the carpenter bee is it's a solitary bee. And um, when, when you deal with solitary bees, most of them are quite docile. Um, it's really a lot of the social insects that are aggressive because they're trying to defend a colony. So you don't get that with carpenter bees. Most people don't like carpenter bees because they burrow into dead and decaying wood. But um, again, they can serve as a good pollinator. Um, so really, it's just a matter of like, you know, treating your wood and providing other suitable habitats. 
um, but they aren't really that aggressive. Um, I know they seem scary. They scare my kids, but um, they usually don't sting. Um, another pollinator I wanted to mention real quick are the squash bees. Um, these are probably one of my favorite. They're just these cute, adorable little bees. Um, again, they're uh, very specific to squash. So if you're going to attract um, the squash bees, you're going to want things like, um, you know, pumpkins and gourds and different squashes. Um, and, you know, before mating, the female bee will actually uh, cuddle up inside the flower um, before mating. And then after mating, she'll, um, you know, build a nest um, nearby, somewhere nearby. And so that's a great little bee and it is will be one um, that's good for pollinating squash uh, plants. Um, and then the last pollinator, again, there's so many different pollinators out there and, and you know, we could do a whole show on the the thousands of pollinators that exist. Um, I should actually mention before I, I go on, there are so many books available, like at least in terms of bees, there's like books on bees and um, feeding the bees and pollinators. Um, but the other one, last one I wanted to mention is one where they have a whole book on uh, the Mason Bee Re Revolution. And the Mason Bee is a really cool be. Um, and it's one that actually has the potential as well to be a very, very efficient pollinator. So, you know, right now we do have concerns about honeybees and, you know, are we going to lose honeybees? And so, you know, there there is the potential for native pollinators to actually serve a function as well in pollinator services. And, you know, the mason bee is one of those bees in particular that um, draws a lot of attention as being very easy to raise, um, being very efficient in pollinating um, and being able to produce large numbers. I don't know if you have any pictures of mason bees, but um, they're really nice because they um, they have like these uh, whole row of hairs on the underside of their belly. And so that allows them to collect a lot of pollen when they visit plants. Um, I'll show you some bee hotels in a little bit and how we can um, raise our own mason bees in our backyard. But again, they're, they're very efficient and they're very docile. They're just a very gentle bee um, because they're solitary, they're not aggressive, um, and they can actually be raised in large enough numbers that they can be used for very efficient pollinator services. So they have drawn a lot of attention um, over the past years and a great way of pollinating um, fruits and blueberries and nuts, um, tree nuts as well. And so, um, so that's, unless you have specific questions on pollinators, I'm going to move on um, and talk a little bit about the fact that just as Thomas had outlined that um, honeybees have stressors, um, well, our native bees do as well. Um, unfortunately, um, that's kind of a fact of life that, um, you know, there's a lot of things that the, the different bees have to deal with. You know, Thomas had talked a lot about pathogens. Um, and so, you know, a lot of those same pathogens that are transmitted to honeybees can also affect other pollinators as well. Um, one of our research objectives of the grant that Thomas had talked about is deform wing virus. We actually have a whole section where we um, have done laboratory studies on um, looking at how deform wing virus affects honeybees. And um, the virus itself is very devastating in that when it's symptomatic, um, it causes these wing deformities. Um, it cripples the, the bee's wings to the point that they can't fly. And if they can't fly, they can't get food. Um, and so that, that will obviously kill off, depending on the level of um, bees in the colonies that have it can really seriously impact the, the hive health. And so, you know, there's been plenty of research to show that um, bumblebees can be affected by these viruses um, and then you know, other native pollinators as well being affected by uh, various viruses and pathogens. You know, in, um, in terms of parasites, Thomas had talked about the varroa mite. Uh, the varroa mite actually has a very, very intimate relationship with the honeybee. And I love how Thomas provided the example of the football feeding on your liver. That's kind of exactly what it would be like um, if we had varroa mites living on us. And, um, you know, um, it's a very intimate relationship it has with the honeybee. And so you don't really see that on native pollinators. But 
native pollinators do have their own uh, parasites and predators as well. You know, and just an example is the uh, mason bee has its own little, we call it a kleptoparasite. So not only does this mite go in and kill off the developing young, but it also steals all the food reserves as well. Um, so, you know, just thinking about that, that they really impact um, bees um, in other ways as well. And so the, the third one that Thomas had mentioned was uh, poor nutrition and forage. Um, and so this is really one that is all, all around has a negative impact on all the pollinators is that loss of um, food reserves and forage. And while the general public can't really do much to, uh, you know, prevent disease and varroa mites in colonies, uh, the general public can help at least in uh, helping to increase forage and habitat for pollinators. Um, we've provided a lot of different, and hopefully Anna will provide you a link, but we have a lot of great resources on the Ag Center webpage that we've done. I know we're like flying through this and we're um, running out of time, but we have resources on pollinator gardening in Louisiana. Um, just a few tips when it comes to pollinator gardening is thinking about uh, flower colors and flower shapes and flower sizes and diversity. You know, most of the people, um, you know, they, they have interest in having uh, landscaping and ornamental plants in their lawn. Um, the important thing to realize is that not all ornamental flowers are going to be pollinator habitats. Some of them just aren't really good food um, you know, food resources for pollinators, you know, so if you're going to have some landscaping, you know, consider, you know, throwing in a few pollinator plants. And again, we have resources on the Ag Center webpage. Um, I just put in, in the comments, I put in the pollinator gardening uh, link. Great. And there's so many like just books and things. Um, and the Xerxes Society has a lot of information as well. Um, I printed out one of theirs uh, sources. They have uh, the plant choices selections that you can find for different regions. So we have the Southeast region and it shows a lot of the different plant varieties um, available if you want to do pollinator gardening. Um, and in terms of pollinator gardening, it doesn't have to be just aesthetics, right? It's, they're great. They're beautiful to look at, but you can also do edible landscaping as well. We have some uh, pubs uh, on the website on edible landscaping. You know, we said, you know, 35% of our food crops rely on bees for pollination. There are so many great food plants that you can plant. I know my kids, we love like planting things in the garden that we can eat, you know, so you can plant things like watermelons and squashes and carrots and cucumbers and blueberries and citrus trees. There is such a wide uh, diversity of edible plants that you can can um, plant in your backyard um, that will also be a great resource for pollinators. Um, and so, and yeah, and then there's other things you can do too. You know, um, pollinators need other resources as well. Um, so they're going to require water um, is one type of thing that they need. You know, you can just easily put out something like a little cup with some rocks in it, pour some water in it and provide a water, clean water resource as well. Um, I forgot to mention herbs, lavender, basil, and things as well. Um, I did have some questions then, for you. We had some questions earlier about um, how can I attract, uh, how do I grow, what do I grow for swallowtails? How do I attract swallowtails to my yard? Yeah, no, and that's a great question. So, um, you know, swallowtails, butterflies, um, you know, a lot of those are going to be attracted to, um, you know, there, there's good and bad in, in a lot of these, right? So with butterflies, you know, they're going to love things like butterfly bush, bee balm, um, really a lot of those just very colorful, small flowered, um, you know, lilacs, just all kinds of those uh, really colorful bush um, uh, flowers. Um, on the flip side, I also wanted to remind people that even with swallowtails, they, the caterpillars can be a pest. So, you know, if you're going to attract things like swallowtails, just realize that um, you know, if you're growing carrots or parsnip, or um, yeah, uh, just parsley, you know, those, those can eventually turn, those caterpillars can be pests on those as well. Um, and I wanted to talk about just one more thing too is, um, you know, providing a home for those bees as well. So many of these bees are ground nesters. 
Um, so if you could provide soils and substrates, like I have a friend that loves to take just terracotta pots and tip them upside down with dirt and substrate in them. Um, and that provides a great resource for the ground nesters. And then um, I'm not gonna talk about bee hotels. I'm just gonna like briefly show you, um, but I have a grad student um, that put out a video a few weeks ago on how to build these bee hotels. But basically if you want to attract mason bees, um, you know, there, it's simply just a matter of, um, you know, finding some household items like a can and putting various tubes in them. You know, we cut things like bamboo. Um, it has a nice little tube, you can see, and then the bee will lay its eggs in there and, and provision it for their young. Uh, for mason bees, they actually sell um, mason bee tubes online, so it's just a cardboard tube. And, you know, you can also use wood and drill holes in wood. Um, but again, you know, this is kind of what the finished product would look like. And a previous postdoc of mine, you know, she would build these uh, much larger display boxes and things. Um, I think at the time, um, you know, another great resource is the uh, LSU Ag Center Botanic Gardens over in Burden. Um, they have a lot of great resources. And I think they had an example, um, one of those bee hotels. Um, they had built a pollinator garden. Uh, several years ago, and you, know, you can go and it's right next to the children's garden. And there's a lot of interactive things for kids there as well. But, um, but yeah, and I think that, um, you know, we have so many great resources on the Ag Center, it's hard to kind of run through everything. But certainly at the end of this show, if people have more questions than we've been able to cover, you know, you can feel free to email um, me or Thomas and, and we can always answer questions for you. Awesome. Let me uh, get him back up on the screen. Let's see. There we go. Uh -huh. And I forgot y'all to put up uh, this chart. I'll... Yeah, no, that's great. That's uh, um, all of uh, that. Those are various fruits, vegetables, and field crops that are pollinated by bees. Um, so again, you know, I, I have a preference personally of going on the edible landscaping route, um, especially with kids, it's fun, attracts pollinators, um, just nutritious. Yeah, I just wanna, I forgot to put that one up there for y'all earlier, so anyways. But thank y'all so much for, for being here and for really going through it. And like, I just, I think pollinators are super important and y'all really, I don't know, just, enveloped at all since all of your research is on it i think it was fascinating and i was like oh my lord i want to bring them on like this is going to be great so thank y'all for being here i really appreciate it yeah you're welcome anytime Definitely. i guess uh, any other questions or at the time no people are just saying thanks and they're really enjoying it and uh, you know I, again guys i put some links in the comments on how to test for varroa mites you know if you want to start your own bees at home beekeeping there's a beekeeping guide we have pollinator gardening guide and that's in the comments as well and um, this video will be available on Facebook um, forever along with YouTube I'm going to put it up on YouTube probably by tomorrow for the Ag Center's YouTube so um, and of course you're looking for more great pollinator content this week um, we have some other videos coming out as well so um, thank you all again for being here and you know contact them guys if you have any more questions and also you know, if you have an insect ID you need, um, that's Kristen's there. Kristen is your person. I actually had a very cool, someone actually um, sent in a pink grasshopper photo earlier and I sent it to her. And what was the name? What was wrong with it? Or oh, it's just a congenital mutation, um, erythema that just makes it uh, reddish in color, pinkish. Okay, so nothing's wrong with it. It's just like a genetic mutation, but that was just fascinating. So again, send her your photos um, and you know we have a great entomology department. So thank y'all again for doing this. Yeah, you're welcome. It's great being here. Happy pollinator week. Yeah, happy pollinator week, y'all. Y'all have a good one. Stay yeah. safe. Bye. Bye.